particularly find it intimidating and I find it antithetical to the democratic process when we should be welcoming people of all opinions and not castigating them if they disagree. Thank you. Betsy. Well, Elaine, thank you. And not surprisingly, I was sent this by a person who, when I was a representative, talked to me frequently and was asked, what does she mean? And all I could think of was that we, as Bruce just said, we do attend the meetings because we are interested and you are castigating us for our interest, even though it doesn't align with your interests. And it's sort of like, why wouldn't you want them to hear when we're having a conversation, our point of view? It's, it's like a doctor who doesn't want to give you a referral to another doctor. Why? Having both sides of the understanding, understanding both positions on the merger is really a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. And none of us kind of Zoom meaning, intimidating. I'm like really surprised how that happens. And I, I think that this is so out of place by the head of our select board to have in here and to have to say, well, I can meet with you personally and give you my perspective, but you won't really, your, your negatives are gonna be your negatives. They're not necessarily our negatives. And hearing all the story is critical to, as Bruce said, the democratic way. I can't, I, I am appalled by what you did. This is not what I thought you would ever do. I'm, I'm really sorry about it. it. It bothers me. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the public? No, I'm sorry. I hear that. Okay. Uh, somebody, uh, Mary Post. Yeah, I just want to agree with um, Bruce and Betsy. And I just feel that because of the way things have been handled, including watching bullying of your own select board members, which is very difficult to watch, um, I just I just feel that this whole thing has been bad from the start. And I feel that there's a lot of increased animosity and ugliness in this in our town and the village because of the way this has been handled. And I blame the select board. I blame especially the you. And I think that there are people that are working hard, but I think the whole thing is just so negative that now everybody's, there's so many people that are fighting with other people. It should not be done. And when there are shots being taken and things written like today, it makes it even worse. It's like, you mean I can't, be in opposition to something without being considered a bad person because I don't agree with you. Number one, with public to be heard, we haven't even been able to have a robust discussion. You know, and so then we're left out of that to begin with. And then if we do our own, have our own meetings, which everyone is invited to and they are open to anyone, then we're considered problems. And the only way we can get information is through what we can glean from the, the meetings that we have or people that we talk to outside of these meetings. And yet then it seemed like it seems like we're considered that we're doing something, you know, on the sly behind closed doors, which is totally not what it is. So I'm just disappointed in the whole process. And um, and I feel quite bad about it. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak? I'm not seeing any other hands. So before we move on, I would like to address these comments. Um, thank you, first of all, for sharing your comments. And I appreciate your honesty and I appreciate your um, willingness to call me out when you feel that I haven't behaved the way you expect. However, um, I really have to disagree with your characterization of the situation. Elected officials are subject to an enormous amount of uh, scrutiny 
and a constant stream of criticism, regardless of actions or words. It's just always there. But we're elected officials and we sign up for that. We understand that that is the thing that's going to happen when we take positions that are unpopular. But regular folks who just want to attend our meetings and share their, their opinions about things, they shouldn't have to deal with that. And they don't want, want to be attacked or face reprisals for their disagreements. And they also don't want to witness other people experiencing that either. And while I am entirely grateful to all of you who attend these meetings on a regular basis, you give up your dinner times, you spend all these hours watching our work, and very few people <laughs> is this dedicated audience of people that is here tonight, you are here at every single meeting. We hear your thoughts every single meeting. And it's information we hear over and over again, and we appreciate your opinion, but we're not getting opinions from many other people. And so my post on Facebook, which was not inappropriate in any way, was offering the fact that the board is looking for feedback on the charter. The board is holding listening sessions about the charter. The board, I put all of our emails up there so that everybody could contact us that way. And I also offered and acknowledged the fact that there is discomfort with some people, many people, who don't like coming to these meetings because they don't want to express their opinion publicly because of the negativity and because of the reprisals that happen offline, in the, even in the neighborhoods. And I'm acknowledging that because people are unhappy about it. I am hearing about it. Other board members are hearing about it. I've seen lots of chatter on Facebook, some significant negativity and people don't like it. So they don't stick their necks out. So kudos to all of you for being willing to stick your necks out on a regular basis and to share your opinions, which are generally counter to what the select board is talking about. We get it, we understand it, and it's entirely your right to speak about these things. But you must also understand that intent is not the same as impact. And your intention is to share with us your thoughts about what we're doing and the fact that you disagree with what we're doing and the fact that you feel we are taking the town in the wrong direction. But you people who are here all the time are not the only residents of Essex. We need to hear from other people who have different opinions from yours. And you may not intend to make people feel like there's negativity happening, but I can assure you that is the impact. And I am equally as guilty because we all get very heated around this conversation. And it's important that we do that, but we have to maintain respect. Today, I was accused of being a Russian spy. I was accused of avoiding quorum. I was accused of trying to schedule individual private meetings and all sorts of shenanigans that are simply not the case. I am providing an additional way for residents to communicate with select board members who don't want to talk publicly. That is all that was. There is nothing inappropriate about it. I am entitled to talk to constituents and they are entitled to talk to me in whatever way they feel comfortable doing. And the same is true for every board member, however they want to communicate with the community, some board members like myself and Pat Murray are willing to do video chats. Some village trustees like Raj Chalwa and Andrew Brown are willing to do video chats. Others are not and would prefer to just do voice uh, email or private conversations at Hannaford's or whatever. The point is there is negativity going around about this merger. There is misinformation. There is conspiracy theories. There is all sorts of nonsense happening. And we are all way better than that. So let's pledge all of us together right now, going forward, to stop attacking each other. I am trying to get communications from other residents whom I have not heard from. That is not something that is inappropriate for a select board chair or a select board member to do. So I appreciate 
You're always holding us accountable for what we're doing, but you have to also let us do our jobs. Thank you. All right, let's move on to business item 5A. Oh, Dawn, please go ahead. Madam Chair, could you ask everybody to mute their mics? There's an awful lot of feedback. I can hear people talking and people chewing and people breathing. Oh dear. Absolutely. If you're not on the mic, please mute your mic. Thanks, everybody. Sorry about that, Dawn. Okay, business item 5A, listening session with public about draft charter for merger of town of Essex and village of Essex Junction. So this is exactly what it is. We would love to hear from all of you your thoughts on the charter. It was in the packet for today's meeting. And we are just interested in hearing what you're thinking, your questions, what's confusing, how can we answer those questions? Greg, please go ahead. Uh, whenever you're done, Elaine, I just wanted to chime in, but um, as soon as you're, whenever you're done speaking. No, I'm done. Okay. Um, if, if the board will indulge me, Evan and I had a chance to uh, chat with Dan Richardson this afternoon and ask him a few questions about the comments and, and edits that he made um, to the charter. That's the that's the version that's in the packet. Um, if it's possible, if I can just take a few minutes and just run through our conversation with Dan to fill people in. That would be great. And Evan, jump in uh, whenever whenever you feel like it. Um, section 103, let me pull up the charter so everybody can see it. First of all, uh, section 103, um, Dan is going to get us a little bit, uh, some, some slightly reworded language, um, just clarifying that town meeting, uh, that there's an informational, that the goal is to have an informational town meeting on the Monday night and the votes happening on town meeting day, the Tuesday. So that section will be slightly reworded, um, most likely in the, in the next coming days. 104B, um, we talked a bit about this last sentence here, uh, the operational budget at a consistent rate for each of those 12 years. Um, Dan took another look at it and speaking to Evan and I and suggested a slight change that the town operational budget, um, reckons, uh, let me just start at the beginning of the sentence here, for a transitional period of 12 consecutive years, commencing from the July 1st effective date of the charter, the unincorporated village of Essex Junction shall be designated as a tax reconciliation district for the purpose of transferring the cost of the village's municipal operations into the town's operational budget. And here's the change at a rate for each of those 12 years consistent with this purpose. Um, so just a slight, slightly reworded there, but hopefully it captures the intent a bit better. And then I can answer any questions you have about why that wording is when we get there. Section 105, um, Dan was going to take another knock at just trying to clarify exactly what the intergovernment board, um, interim governing board will be in the transition phase and the timing there. So again, you might see some slight changes uh, after tonight to that section. Section 301B, Um, Andy had had some questions about the May uh, being changed to shall in terms of the creating the wards um, for the voting wards. Uh, Dan recommended uh, that we stick with shall. Uh, the select board uh, shall make the changes based on an ordinance. Um, he said that the legislature is going to want to know how and how wards are passed or how wards are changed and uh, saying the select board shall do it through an ordinance will define and clarify that for the legislature. Section 403, this is another one that Andy caught, um, speaking about the town treasurer and town clerk. Uh, in section 403, it had said appointed. Um, further on down in section, I think it's 702, it speaks about those two positions being hired. Um, recommend changing the word to hired here just for uh, consistency's sake. And the last section in the uh, select board might want to discuss this when we when we get to it um, or whenever you, you desire tonight. 
uh, sections 803 and 804, the Planning Commission and the Development Review Board. Um, the Select Board had originally left it open in terms of the number of members on the uh, board and the commission and the length of their term. Um, everything would have to be beholden to statute, which is the Planning Commission at sections uh, 24 VSA 4322 and 4323. For the Development Review Board, it's um, 24 VSA 4460. Uh, Dan recommended putting in, he, he suggested two-year terms for the Planning Commission and uh, three-year terms for the De Development Review Board. Um, anything within the, the term length um, allowed by statute is acceptable, uh, but Dan recommended that the term length be put into statute, or sorry, put into the charter. Um, just to provide some consistency, lets people know what they're signing up for, uh, lets the select board know what their expectations are for these for these board members. And the number of members uh, can be set by policy or, or can be in the charter. Um, and, and for planning commissions, it's anywhere from three to nine members. Uh, for development review boards, anywhere from five to nine members. And if the board wants to have alternates, which I believe was the, the direction the board wanted after meeting with the planning commissions and zoning boards, um, those alternates should be called out in charter. So that was it. Um, as Evan said, happy to provide some clarification, but just wanted to run through those changes um, so everybody is aware of them as we get started. And uh, Greg, if you could go back up to the 12 consecutive years, I believe it, right, is that 103? Hard to scroll through a 24 page document when the thing you want yeah. is up at the top <laughs> and you're at the bottom. OK, uh, so um, there has been comments before about the 12 year period and that the. Um, so the mechanism, so if you think about it sort of structurally on a given budget year, you you want to move the entire village budget into the town budget over a 12 year period, you generally would want to do it consistently every year. OK, so let's just say if you took. Some number uh, 20, 24 and divided by 12 consecutive years, you would come out with two per year. The, the issue with that is, is that that may be your intent, but from year to year, um, you're going off of the growth of the grand list. And from year to year, you might have a reason to either make it two and a half or one and a half. But the intent is still the same, that at the end of the 12 years, the entire village budget is um inside the town budget and you are trying to get to a unified tax rate for a, a home except for anything else that is a special district or a bond that only some people paid for um but in general this is the wording that dan felt more comfortable with that again, over this 12 year period, consecutive 12 years, that's the one that doesn't change. The, the village budget would be consumed by um, the entire town into a tax rate um, that after the 12th year would be um, the same, whether you're in the town outside the village or the village district, whichever one, that's what it would be. So um, I didn't want somebody to believe or say that you promised that you would keep this at the same rate every year. It might end up being that way. It may be slightly different, but at the end, it should be an equalized tax rate. Thanks, Evan. Um, Board members, do you have any questions or comments regarding Dan Richardson's feedback on this? Andy, I know you had a number of questions. Why don't you go ahead and then Dawn? Um, 
section section 103 as long as we're here um, we had at our last meeting talked about the possibility of the charter being approved before town meeting in a given calendar year and we had added the following calendar year oh meeting day following approval we moved we had that that we added that in and then it got removed again by dan i'm just wondering if in your discussion with dan you you explained to him why we had added that it was yeah. the because the because yeah. if if because if the if the if it's approved by the legislature in january or february you have a real hard time warning right. the first town meeting right right and that's why we generally have asked that if they do that um the effective date would be a july one of the new charter then maybe the I, maybe the i can August, yeah maybe i can suggest that this needs to say it, it, following the effective date of the charter rather than approval of the charter because approval to me tells me that's when the legislature approves it not when the charter becomes effective so that's where i'm okay maybe, maybe that's the fix yeah. that's needed and then i you know mo most of, most of the other questions i had were, were answered by th with with uh, what greg just went through um, but i did have a question about uh, 301 the um, setting the wards by ordinance. Is that saying that any changes to, I mean, the, the charter sets the initial wards and then any changes to it need to be done by ordinance? Is that what that section is saying? That is correct. Okay, so we don't need to, to enact an ordinance to establish the first wards. Um, Greg, I believe he said we do have to establish that ordinance. Yeah, I think he did say that. Yes, we are okay, going so to then. establish that first ordinance. It says that we're going to do it. it. We will. Basically, what we would do and, and is because they're the exact boundaries, but we have to do it in map form. You know, so in that in that transition period, uh, that would be one of the ordinances we should pass. So this is not in the transition section. Do we need to something in the transi transition section that defines that we're going to define those wards by ordinance? It's not, this, this did, is in the permanent section, so that's why I'm- he, he did not feel that was necessary, only that we know it needs to get done. Okay, okay. And we are um, probably easier said than done but uh because of gis i hope we're gonna we, we should be able to do it uh quite well but it is going to take us to make sure that when we do it the boundaries are delineated right and address strings are put together andy was was that all your questions and the the other one, um, it, it, and I don't know if it's a different discussion, is the the Dan had put in term lengths for the the DRB and the Planning Commission, which we had just decided to take out. And um, in fact, that the village took the at least the Planning Commission ones out of theirs as well. So I'm just, or no, they didn't. They have term they, they do have the term still in there, but I think they have four years instead of three. But I don't know. Anyway, I don't know if this is something we need to have a discussion on. I, I guess I don't care how long the terms are, but I thought we had intentionally yeah. taken them out so we could yeah. define it by policy. One one of his comments was where there is, if you want to use the term conflict, um, where they are in, not in agreement. Let's try that. Where they are not in agreement, uh, that is where they will probably ask the two parties to come to some agreement, and that's when you can do it. So if they're if you're at two and they're at four, they'll either ask the parties, do you want to be one or the other or meet in the middle? Um, I, okay, I, 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 I understand that, but I, I, I don't understand why they've gone back in after we had the discussion about intentionally taking the term lengths out. 
He so. mentioned in today's meeting that the state would would prefer to see something of that nature. Is something is it something specific to these two boards that requires that? Because none of our other boards have defined term lengths. We, no, can we, yeah. we mentioned the library in here. We mentioned other yeah. we uh, other. I'm sorry. He, he also mentioned that the state doesn't necessarily require that you put it in your charter at all. You can do it. it right. It's just that when you have a plan commission, um, the state statute is what it is. You can have anywhere from, I believe, Greg, three to nine members, mm -hmm. but the village, but the select board sets their terms and can do so. Um, so that's yeah, I, what this comment was. I think the term links, uh, I have to double check statute, but I think it's one to four years. Um, right. Currently, the town has four year planning commission terms and the village has three. Uh, Dan put in two, I'm not sure exactly why he, he said two, but um, he did He did say it's provide some, some clarity uh, to the board, to planning commissioners. Um, if you're gonna keep in term links, I would just recommend doing what the, the, the village charter um, proposed merger charter says, which I believe was four year terms for the planning commission. Um, so if you want to change it to four, I don't think that's going to be a problem. And if you want to take it out, that would be, I think that's acceptable too, um, as long as there's a policy of defining how, how long they are. The term lengths need to be set by a vote though, don't they? Or do they not in this, for this case, for the, am I wrong? The select board would create a policy. Uh, the new select board would create a policy so yeah. the commission has terms of three years, four years, whatever um, the decision is. Yeah, I'm I'm I, I'm a little at a loss here to to because the 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 planning commission role changes in this model as well. So I don't know the the benefits of a two year versus a four year term. So I I I, I struggle a little bit with making that decision arbitrarily here I don't I'm so anyway I, sure. I can can I add in um you know I agree with Andy's observation this is something that the board specifically said we didn't want terms in here and I'm hearing from you Greg that it's up to us whether we have them in or not we've already decided not to have them in and I'd rather talk you know have empower the new board to make that decision as to what term lengths they should be after their own considered conversation. So, uh, and would Greg, you like to say, go ahead, Evan? So, why don't we just strike for two the sentence for in the part for two year terms? Yes. Yeah. And I then just that. And do you want to define a seven member board? That was what we've had all along. It's fine. Um, Dan says it falls within the required minimum and maximum, so seven seems to be fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Elaine, if you don't mind me mentioning, um, the request we got from the Planning Commission um, when we met was that they wanted to try to keep as much institutional knowledge as they could. And if we're only able to have, you know, a two alternate members, we may want to consider making the commissions as large as possible um, to incorporate bringing both boards together. Um, just a thought before we move on, because if we set it to seven, then we're definitely going to be losing people from the commissions. Pat, I'm sorry, your words dropped right at an important moment when you were speaking. So Greg, you're you're making changes. You're adding alternate members, I see. Yeah, Pat, Pat was saying uh, he was wondering if there's a limit to the number of alternate members. Should the should the commission and the board be larger to keep the institutional knowledge that's on there now? And we can in speaking to Dan, you don't have to. He, he put two as the number of alternates, but there's no limit on the number of alternates statute. Uh, refers to the size of the planning commission. So right. uh, the board can uh, discuss whether two is enough alternates, uh, if you want to increase that. Okay. I would say that I, I remember what the planning commissioner said, and that's an excellent point. Um, 
I'm wondering also, do we need to set an actual number here or can we say a sufficient number of alternate members or something like that or and, and allow the the future board to set that number in, as policy? I, I think you could probably put and shall appoint alternate members um, as necessary. Okay. Does that seem to satisfy the different concerns we had with this section? I see yes, a thumbs up thank, from Pat. Yes, yes, thank you. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Okay, Andy, are you? Do you have more, or can we go to Juan? That that that's all. That's all my questions. They're all okay. my comments. Thanks. The others were addressed. Yep. All right, Dawn, thanks for your patience. That's okay. There was some also discussion from um, Dan about the role of a moderator at our town meeting, and I'm sorry, I don't know the section, Greg. But I think it's important that we keep a moderator in place because we also act on reports of officers at our town meeting, and we need somebody to moderate any kind of presentation that may occur. I'll jump in. In our conversation today, um, so in this form, you can have a moderator. His comment about it could be that you can either, in general, because you're doing Australian ballot, you don't necessarily have to elect a moderator. You can appoint one. So that is maybe some a question of whether you want to have the town select board appoint a moderator or it versus electing one um, because there's again it's by Australian ballot and the and the role of the moderator in the informational meeting would just be to run that meeting so I don't know if you guys want to consider appointment appointing One of the questions that about this that Andy had last time was that report of the manager report of the officers. You know, is that even something that we'll be doing if the budget is being voted on by Australian ballot by that time? You know, will we re if we're having an informational only meeting, then why would we be voting on things at the informational meeting? You will not be working on things at the informational meeting. Got it. Which is why you're suggesting appointing a moderator, not electing yeah. them. Okay. Now, his comment was some communities prefer keeping the moderator because they know how to run the meeting. Right. They know the rules and procedures. Um, we have a great and an efficient moderator in Mr. Eustace. Um, I have had, you know, you guys have been here a lot longer. I don't know how long he's been doing it, but he runs a pretty efficient meeting. I would, I would keep for myself, if it was up to the manager, I'd keep appointing him as long as he wanted to do it. <laughs> well, as it's an elected office at the moment, and has been, the voters have chosen Steve Eustace many years in a row. So um, I, I have no problem with keeping it as an elected position. Um, I'm happy to defer to other board members. Dawn, what are your thoughts? As we're giving up traditional town meeting as we've known it for the last 200 years. I really would prefer to keep it as an elected position. Okay. Andy? Um, I guess my only question is whether there's added expense associated with that. I mean, there's a budget, there's, there's, there's a ballot going out anyway because we're electing, we're always electing select board members and we'll then potentially be also voting on the ballot. So I guess there's no additional cost to doing a, to having it be a elected position, right? I don't think so. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm fine with it either way. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, board members, are you good to go with the comments from Dan Richardson? Okay. So apologies to those of you in the audience who have been waiting to talk about the charter. Um, last minute changes, uh, as you see, but um, if anyone would like to talk to us about the charter, share some information, some questions, some concerns, um, we would love to hear from you. So please indicate either by raising your hand or letting us know in the chat that you'd like to speak. I see Hubert Norton. Go ahead. I am here. Can you hear Hi. me now? Uh, yes, first, we can hear you. First of all, uh, just to uh, add another comment regarding the moderator. Uh, in traditional town meeting, we are uh, acting on the reports of the officers. Uh, and will that require a ballot item in order to vote to approve the uh, officers' reports? Uh, I would expect that uh, there would be discussion about the uh, officer's reports at the town meeting. Uh, and although we might not be voting on them there, I would assume that you would have to have an approval some way, but expect that it would be on the ballot. Is that affirmative? Evan, is that, so my understanding from the conversation we just had was that um, at an informational meeting, we would not be voting on the officer's reports. However, we would certainly be presenting the auditor's report in the in the, the booklet that you get and in our annual report. Um, and Greg, correct me if I'm wrong. In our discussion today, he said we don't, there, there is no vote. At the informational meeting, there is no vote. So when you vote for the budget, um, you're voting for the approval. On the budget, yes. I'm trying to remember. I don't think we spoke about the reports of the officers when we talked to Dan today. Um, we can we can get confirmation. Yeah, we can get a clarification. I, I I have a memory that we may not need to approve those if if it's part of the new charter that we don't. Um, I think it's been a and it's been a tradition in Essex, but it. I don't know that other towns do it, but we can try to get confirmation from Dan as to whether or not that's needed and what the process would be for approving the reports of the officers. Okay, well, I have a couple of other things. This is Hubie Norton again. And, oh, right and, by, yeah. and by the way, uh, there were a couple times there when Greg was providing the feedback that a, a couple speak, a couple different people spoke, but it wasn't clear who they were for us that don't necessarily recognize voices. Uh, it would be good if people would identify themselves before they spoke. Um, anyway, uh, the moderator question aside, uh, realizing this is not necessarily a, a budget discussion, uh, there are obviously provisions in the proposed charter that will directly impact any final budgets developed under a merged municipality. Aside from all those special districts that are proposed within the village that will have their own budget controversies, believe me, uh, I'd like to ask about a specific special district included uh, that I propose that, that should be uh, in the charter. Uh, and also I'll talk about one that is not proposed that maybe should be considered. First, the special district that is included. Why does the proposed charter perpetuate the Brownell Library Trust? And how can any synergies and economy of scales be developed between the two libraries if it's overshadowed by the Brown Owl Library Trust. Currently, the village budget includes $750,850, or a, a massive 14% of the total village budget for the Brown Owl Library. And it has increased approximately 10% since 2019. Meanwhile, the Upper Tree Library is budgeted at $391,959, which includes $15,000 for the Brownell Library, and it is still 3% of the total town budget, which is only about 8% from 2019. So uh, why, why does the proposed order have this nice special little paragraph about the Brownell Library? Uh, why aren't we breaking that trust? 
I'll take a stab at it, Evan, and then. Okay. So, um, so your one of your questions was, will there be any synergies between the two libraries? And the answer is yes, and there currently already are. Um, staff are shared between the two libraries in many instances, and the library's hours are coordinated to be one's open when the other one isn't. And the library directors work very closely together currently, and the plan is for them to continue doing so into the future. Um, as for the special paragraph about the brown owl in the charter, uh, section 401, that chapter is about all the other offices in the town that are elected besides the select board. And the Brownell Trust, it indicates that f five of the Brownell board members are to be elected. And so that's why the Brownell appears in that section of the charter. Um, the Brownell Trust is not something we can break up unless we want to do some significant legal battling. And that is not what we're looking to do. What we're trying to do is maintain the status quo with our libraries so that our residents are served at their expectation. And there has definitely been a historical disagreement as to the dollar amount of the budget items for both libraries. But it's also important to understand that they are very, very different libraries that see very, very different levels of patronage and perform very different services in um, many cases. So. I know that's not specifically addressing what you're asking, which is what you know what cuts are going to be made to make the budgets more affordable for the libraries. That's not the plan. We are um, maintaining the service level that our residents expect, and we are not um, intending to break the Brownell Library Trust. Okay, my second, my, uh, and second point of a special district that is not included which should be considered to be included is the portions of the village water and sewer infrastructure that is approaching 100 years old and will probably be expecting some replacement costs in the not too distant future. And why was the significant difference in infrastructure age between the village and town outside the village not considered for a special, special district within the village? I have to ask Evan to answer that uh, because I think we do address it. Sure. But Evan, I'd like yeah, you to take we, that one. We, we do address it. Um, the water systems of the village and the town are generally distinct, and the costs to operate those systems are going to stay within those systems. So, for instance, a water main that serves the village. Um, and only the village customers, if it needs to be repaired, that cost is then um, stays with that district. Um, so um, if the village's system is aging and it needs repairs, that uh, cost will be reflected in the rates to those uh, system users, not to the entirety of the entire system. That's how they were addressed. So it's not a special district, Evan. It's just the way the entire water sewer system is going to work as laid out in the charter. Correct. So any bonding that might be required in order to finance uh, any uh, reconstruction uh, would be uh, that bonding cost would only be uh, the burden of those users within that particular Correct. district. Correct. And if there was any overlap into the other district, then that only that portion of the work would be uh, shared. So sometimes we have things like transmission mains that go from one to the other, or there's a benefit to the other system. Only that portion of benefit would go to the other system as a charge. Understood. So that's how we are keeping the systems and their costs separate for legacy. <laughs> Well, one last question, more a comment than a question. Uh, I brought this up at the meeting, uh, the uh, Zoom meeting, which by the way, uh, I'm not a great fan of, but uh, this is where we are. Um, regarding the uh, DRB uh, Planning Commission's uh, proposed in the new charter. Um, and I go back to 
the meetings that were held uh, five or six years ago when it was recommended uh, that there be one planning commission and two DRBs. And although that was uh, talked about with a kind of a status quo uh, uh, consideration, uh, there was this hint that, yeah, this is moving towards a merged situation. And uh, I believe that uh, because there are two, and I think quite distinct, different zoning regulations within the village and the town outside the village, that having one DRB, you're essentially going to have that one DRB working as two independent DRBs each time something comes up within a particular ward because the regulations are different. And I don't see how uh, that those two existing regulations can be amalgamated uh, within one year so that uh, one DRB could act on them recently. Uh, so anyway, I'm, I still would uh, prefer to see uh, a DRB within each ward uh, for some interim time frame until the regulations, the zoning regulations of both wards are, are as I say, amalgamated, made into one, uh, and then one DRB might be appropriate. Anyway, that's comment. Uh, that's all I have for the moment. Thank so you. Those are, you're welcome. Those are some excellent comments and questions, Hubert. And I suggest also, if you can, stick around for the remainder of the meeting because Charlie Baker, who is the director of the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission, will be joining us in a little while. And he might be able to speak specifically to how CCRPC is going to help us bring the two zoning codes together after merger. Um, Greg. Yeah, a couple of follow-up comments um, to, to Hubert. Um, section 112 uh, is the section that Evan was speaking to where it talks about the costs that are specific to each system. We'll stay with that system for the water sewer districts. And I just wanted to call out too that uh, Fort Ethan Allen is in the town water system. Um, some of those pipes are 100 years old. Um, so there's just certainly costs on, on both systems that uh, you know, repairs and infrastructure that they're going to have to be dealt with at some point. Um, and as far as the uh, Development Review Board and the Planning Commissions, um, it, the plan is that not to not to incorporate all everything together into one year. Um, the Section 109 of the transitional phase speaks to bring those, those codes and systems together over several years. Um, so just want to make sure everyone is aware of that too. It's not an expectation that it's going to happen in year one. There'll be a, a five years, I believe, um, to transition. Um, and, and bring those uh, sets of regulations together. And, and I'll, I'll, I will add back into the water and sewer comment. Um, good point about Fort Ethan Allen. There are also a significant amount of lift stations that the town uses to get sewerage to the treatment plant, more than the village. And those are also aging um, as well. So. There, there's lots of costs to go around between our water systems and our sewer systems. So um, the trick is how to make sure that you're keeping on top of those those issues so that you're cost effectively repairing and replacing them in a timely manner. So thanks. Okay. Happy to hear more comments. Thank you. So Sharon Zukowski has her hand up and then Lorraine Zaloom is on the phone. So go ahead, Sharon, and then Lorraine. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm, I'm, this isn't specific um, about the merger, but it's about uh, um, the wording. And I noticed that uh, the word shall um, appears about 280 times and the, the problem sometimes with shall is that it can mean um, will, may, or must and it's probably the most litigated word in the English language. So if you really want something to happen and not for it not to be litigated, you use the word must and if you, if you inserted that in there, you would see like something must happen. Mm -hmm. But shall can mean in the future. It can be uh, mostly courts, like if it went to appeals or the Supreme Court, they say that any statute or law that has the word shall 
will be interpreted as May, which means that it might not happen because May isn't specifically an, a legal obligation. It's we might do this. So when you shall 280 times, 280 times, it opens yourself to a massive amount of litigation because you're not saying must. And it, it used to be taught in legal school to use shall, but any attorney like under the age of 45 no longer uses shall. They always use must. Unless they want to be sneaky and put in shall because they know they won't have to do it. It's a game. Just a thought. OK, it, I, I'll take this interesting. Um, we I can will... send you a little link on the Supreme Court decision that says any statute that is litigated up to. I mean, obviously, the murder is not going to go to the Supreme Court of the United States, I hope. <laughs> but uh, one, one would that hope. would be interesting. Um, but the Supreme Court does when it gets there say that if you said shall, it means may in I, any law. I would be happy to see the link. Also happy to talk with not only the merger attorney, but also the town attorney. Um, He's over 45, though. Both of them are <laughs> probably right around there, but, but they do like a good article. Um, yeah, so I, I, I used to have this argument with an attorney I worked with all the time, and he, he did start using must um, okay. instead of shall because he did get into litigation in um, a trust over the word shall, like you shall pay this. Mm -hmm. And the argument was shall doesn't mean you I must pay you. It means it could mean any of these three and I interpret as may. Yeah. Well, thank you. And we, we've thought. had our conversations and our interpretation of shall is you must, but I will certainly bring it up with the attorney. And I bet your town attorney will think that too, because I, 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 he's he's definitely way over forty-five. <laughs> Hold on now, let's and, not go. Okay, I'm sixty-three. I'm not. In, I'm not <laughs> being an ageist. I'm like I'm almost dead. So I just have to protect. I have to protect Bill. He's not here to defend himself. I know, and I'm just teasing. I mean, I'm 63. Okay. I'm not being ages, but it You're is a, uh, it, it it when he was going to law school, shall was must. It no longer is. Okay, I'll share it with him. Thank you. I'm sure he'll love it. Don't tell him it was for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have a nice day. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, Lorraine Zaloom, you're on the phone. Yes. Can you? I'm Go not ahead. sure if you can hear me. We sure can. Go ahead. Oh, excellent. Thanks, Elaine. It's Lorraine Zaloom. Um, just a, that was a very interesting comment. <laughs> that was very good. Um, we're all a bit older than 25. Um, so uh, just a clarification on the uh, transitional member board. Um, I was curious if, is it clear in the charter proposal if a select board member, since there's two seats that are up, um, for election, and this might go on for up for a vote in March. Mm -hmm. If those two seats are not reelected, would they, if if it gets passed through the legislature before their term is up, even though they weren't reelected, would they be able to still serve on that transitional board? Um, I I'm not sure. If I'm understanding your question, so there's two seats up for election in March of 2021. So whoever wins those seats would be seated in the following that that April. And according to Section 105, those existing members of the select board and the existing members of the trustees would form the interim governing body and that would include whoever is officially seated at that in each board am i, I right so uh, my right so to me there's this weird point between the election which is in march and the end of the term which i believe is in april the are the terms up in april yes yes so if if the person wasn't reelected in March, but their term isn't up until April and the merger gets passed before their seat is up, would that person, since their term wasn't up and the charter proposal is now, I guess, enacted when it goes through legislation, if that happens before 
the select board member's term is up, would they then still serve on the transitional board? I, I think I see what you're saying, and um, the, it doesn't sound like the language is uh, that clear uh, about it to me because of that kind of interim. Sure, okay. I mean, you know, it, it's the it's unlikely that the legislature is going to approve the new charter before the first Monday in April after the election. But in the event Agreed. that it's it unlikely, did, but right, it, right, it could but, still happen. It could, but in the event that it did, I mean. If if the person who loses a seat on Mar in March, they they need to step down from the select board by the by the first meeting of April. So the new person would take their seat and they would go into the new board. I, I don't I don't see this as a, a a loophole to perpetuate those two seats that are up for re-election in April, in March. If that's what you're saying. Yeah, that's what I just one clarification on. So also um, in terms of that board being the transitional board being an equal number board for those first uh, for that first year, does that in a way in terms of what you were saying about statute that the boards have to be either three or five, does that set a precedent for an equal number board despite being transitional? I think we had this conversation before. Um, Andy had pointed. We did, but but yeah, Andy, Andy had said it sets a precedent, but it didn't clarify if that precedent then also covers just being select board, since it is a select board, regardless of being transitional or not. And the other question I had was, if Dan, in terms of what the Essex town charter proposal is, includes a three plus three and equal number board model, I assume that means Dan said you don't have to take that out. The transitional governing body is different from a select board, and we have to be very clear on that delineation. And so, yes, the two boards would come together to form the interim governing body, and yes, it would be an even numbered board for that temporary period between the approval of the charter and the election of the permanent select board. And then depending upon what the legislature rules, if the select board is to be three plus three, then that is what it would be. If the select, if the legislature decides that is not what they want, then the permanent select board would follow whatever it is the legislature recommends. But Dan, did Dan say you had to take it out? Because did he? I would assume, as a, a lawyer, as a town lawyer, he would say you'd have to take it out if it's not meeting state statute. So I'll answer this: the select board has inserted it into the document. Dan Richardson is our attorney. He does not feel that he he does he believes the state is going to have a problem with three plus three. However, it was the select board's requirement that it be in the charter. It would go down to the government ops uh, of the house and they will take it up. Um, so in so other words, it, it could not, be legal. It, it's it's going to be up to the legislation. Correct. Yes. In terms of their interpretation of that statute. Yes. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. Mm, okay, you're welcome. Um, Pat, Murray, go ahead, and then Ken. Uh, I think uh, speaking to Lorraine, what she mentioned, I think very specifically the fact that any transition board is by its very nature temporary is what gives Dan or at least you know why he doesn't yeah. feel like that's any uh, conflict with what the state is typically recommending um, and I just want to be clear Lorraine when you mentioned I think you mentioned statute a couple of times I'm not aware of any explicit statute um, the recommendation that we've gotten is that the legislature generally does not uh, the, generally does not approve even number boards um, for a number of reasons. The likelihood of ties certainly is amongst them, um, but I don't believe that there's any explicit statute that having a transition board is going against. I think that it is more a procedure based sort of thing to avoid potential conflicts that come up in running business with an even numbered board. Thanks, Pat. 
Uh, okay, go. Andy, go ahead. Do you want to weigh in on this topic? Yeah, I just I just wanted to comment that every um, merger agreement between any two municipalities includes one of these transitional boards, which end up being an even number board. And the fact that the charter gets approved, that charter becomes statute. And so there's the, that's the statute that authorizes that temporary even numbered board is the approved uh, charter, which includes the transitional piece of it. And so that's that's I think the where that comes from. And you know that because you investigated a lot of charters when we got started with this process. I read them all. Yeah. 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 OK, um, Ken and then Betsy. Good evening. I want to bring your attention to section 101. Um, yeah, section 101. Thank you. So section 101 has two sex, two um, subsections. Um, part A talks about the transfer of all assets, obligations and debts, including bonded debts without any um, further act deed or instrument being necessary. Part B talks about contracts and agreements and trusts being transferred. I find it odd that the exception that is part of the special tax district for the debt is an exception in part B, starting from pursuant to 104. By the way, that should be 104A. I believe that that sentence, starting from pursuant in part B, should be at the end of part A. If it isn't, and I was of a litigious nature, and or I was a lawyer representing my client, I might make the following claim. Part A says all debts transfer. There is a special tax district for debt remediation. I would make the claim that, well, all debts are transferred. So the debt referred to in that section is zero. So simple solution to the problem. It's a little ambiguous, a little contradictory. I don't think there's any legal trickery going on here. Just move the sentence. Pursuant to 104A, the incorporated village shall become a debt assessment district. Should be at the end of part A of 101. We can certainly talk with Dan about that. I'm sure um, we're just an oversight. No, it's not an oversight. No, it's not an oversight. It's it may be a matter of legal preference, um, but there is also state statute that you the people who voted on debt that's where it stays. Right. So you can have a legal challenge, but you're not going to get past that statute either. If the voters approve this, a person, a lawyer yeah. might say, well, yes, there's legal statute, but the voters are approving it. Yeah. So that's where you may look into an argument. We will certainly have a look let's, at this. Let's stay out of the Supreme Court. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, maybe that's state awesome. Supreme Thank Court. Thank you. OK. Um, Ken, was that everything? Yes, that's it for me. Thank you. OK, um, Betsy, and then um, I see that Lorraine would like to make another comment, but I want to wait until everyone who hasn't spoken has a chance to say something first. OK, Lorraine? So Betsy and then Tracy. OK, um, I believe Sarah Macy gave us a report um, late September, might have been October, I'm not sure. Um, on her, her assumptions for the estimate cost of the merger. And she used a really low number, I remember, was zero percent increase. And I just don't think that that's really a reality. Um, and I'm wondering if we can ask her to redo that with a little bit more of a growth factor there and a little bit more of a um, increase in expenses, because I don't think it's going to be zero. Do you? No, I think that was a model that Sarah provided for us, and she removed all as many of the moving parts as possible to give us an accurate picture of a baseline. But there is going to be increases in expenses, and there is going to be increases in the grand list. And so those numbers will change, but I think the overall assessment is that the numbers will not change dramatically. But Evan, would you want to be a little bit more specific about that? I don't know that Sarah is present tonight. I don't think so. Uh, I thought no, I'm no. Okay. okay, nope. So 
Betsy, I, I think going back about a month and a half ago, her charge was what is the cost of separation? And she had to keep certain things constant. And while this may make headlines, I'm not sure what stays constant in in government and taxation and expenses. <laughs> so I, I I would I would not I would not say that zero is a is a extreme possibility. So um, if you want to talk offline, we could talk about um, that that presentation and maybe uh, come to some understanding of what is meant by it. But it was an exercise in separation, not in merger. OK, I have one follow up question. Can I ask? Absolutely. Oh, good, great. And this is about um, Evan's position about the town manager. It has it has worried me to death about when we do our negotiations for the uh, town, the total town and the town and the village, but I think it's just really the, the town of Essex, the whole the whole being, that we do the um, negotiations for their contracts for the union employees before we even do a budget. I'm wondering how that really works because if Evan says, okay, you're going to get a 3% 3 3 raise the first year and the next two, you're going to get two and two or reverse, whichever. And, um, but we haven't even passed the budget yet. And we pass a budget that does not agree with that cost for that we did. Should that negotiation be happening after we pass a budget? And the part B of that question is, and I, believe and maybe I'm wrong that there's a me too in that um, contract for the non unionized workers that they would get the same raises that do the union workers get and Evan uh, this is pointed I know I'm sorry um, does that include your position so I could answer the last one first okay no oh, it good. does not include my position the the board sets uh, does my evaluation and uh, any increase on an annual basis. Oh, good. Thank you very much. Second, our contracts usually are three year contracts, so you cannot set them every year on the budget. In fact, our budget is generally um, based mostly on what those contracts um, are because um, roughly 70% of our cost is personnel. The boards approve those contracts, though. Right. So whatever is negotiated by the manager in the negotiations is approved by the select board and or the village board and is usually set for two up to three years. Um, there's no there's no this year. We have a one year agreement with our association of the village and the town asked me, but the police contract is three years. Well, I, so, I'm not. I'm not trying to deny anyone a raise. No. I'm, I'm just I'm, trying to figure out as it happens. But once every three years, you're negotiating a new contract. Right. And so does that occur before or after the budget? Because having negotiated the contract for, let me think, nine contracts at the hospital for the unionized nurses, that they knew exactly how much they had to have for a um, raise, and they were holding us to that. And so I'm just wondering how it works here in, in this kind of a thing. And I know it, that's probably too much in the weeds here, but it's just a question, and maybe you can get back to me about that. Sure. No, no, it, it's a good question, Betsy. And so Evan's job, if I may, Evan, um, Evan's job in relation to the agreement and to the select board is that he is aware of the select board of the but he's aware of the town budget and he's aware of the select board's wishes in terms of what we feel the budget needs to be and so he works out with the union what the agreement is going to be and then the select board is responsible to approve that so if the select board uh, if the manager brings the select board a draft contract that the select board does not want to approve, the select board will not approve it. Um, that said, 
the negotiations are done in good faith and um up until now, we have not had a significant issue with, you know, the unions asking for some astronomical increase and the select board saying you get nothing. I mean, there's always been compromise and that's reflected in the budget. Okay. Does that you. answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, Tracy Delphia. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Elaine. I just have a, a maybe two quick questions. Um, so the numbers for the Planning Commission and the DRB are set by statute. I believe for the Planning Commission, the max was nine. Uh, if we're incorporating alternates into the mix uh, and the charter indicates seven members for the Planning Commission, does that limit us for alternates to two for a max of nine members? Uh, no, uh, because they are alternates, um, Dan believes you can have uh, more alternates, but only those members present. So let's say you have seven, you can only have seven members at present at that meeting voting. Okay, and just for a little bit of background, because I don't know the answer to this question, I know the, the ZBA for the town does not have alternates. Where did the, the, what is the purpose of an alternate? Where did that come from? It's, it's something I'm not familiar with. Um, well, the Planning Commission, both, the, I, I can't speak specifically for the village. I believe they do have alternates as well, but as long as I can remember, there's just been there's been alternates who would have a seat in the event that a board member could not be there, a commissioner could not be there for um, the review of an application. Um, recently, the town select, uh, planning commission asked for a village planning commissioner to be a an alternate so that they could attend meetings and be involved in conversation in an effort to um, bridge the two planning commissions more closely together and foster some familiarity with both land development codes. But um, I, I couldn't tell you the, the origin of it though, Tracy. Yeah, and I think that makes sense. Um, this is my, my general comment. I think that makes sense from an interim standpoint to keep that institutional knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, previously, as you know, I, I, I came from a, a town of 18,000 people uh, we had a seven thousand or a, a seven member planning commission and a seven member DRB. Uh, so those I'm, I'm definitely familiar with, and I've I've never seen the need for an alternate in those situations. Um, you know, we had our set meetings. We knew when they were. Uh, the members made the time uh, in effort to be present um, and to to set aside that time uh, twice a month for those meetings. Um, so I just I, I, I question the use of alternates um, as sort of a fallback position to having a quorum present and ready to act, especially if we're combining uh, these two bodies from, you know, the, the, the two bodies that currently exist. Mm -hmm. um, by essence, we're going to have a larger pool of folks that are familiar and that are ready to act uh, in that capacity. Um, so I, I just I've personally I've never seen the need uh, arise to basically activate an alternate um, just just for um, personal knowledge from a neighboring community. Oh, I, I totally I, I understand that. Thank you. I, I can say that this past year on the town select board, excuse me, the town planning commission, one of their members. Um, took a foreign assignment for his job, but he really wanted to, and it was in the middle of his term and he really wanted to remain a member. And so an alternate took his seat for the whole year. Um, I mean, that's an the only example I have of actually using an alternate, but that, that is something that we did this past year. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, comments, um, thoughts about the draft merger charter? We will be doing this again on November 16th, which is our next select board meeting. Dawn, go ahead. You said you had Lorraine on the phone again. Thank you, thank you. Lorraine, please go ahead. 
I didn't want to interrupt Elaine. <laughs> uh, sorry. That's all right. Um, I just wanted to address Pat's comment and uh, thank you for responding to what I was saying um, about the statute. The only place I got that that uh, it was against state statute was from Elaine uh, when she went on the radio and said right. it was against state statute. So that was Elaine's interpretation. It was not my interpretation. So that's why I brought it up again, because if Dan said it's not against state statute, but it, it's not something that the state would love, that's a whole different thing than being against state statute. So I just wanted to comment on that. And thanks, Pat. Right. I referred to the statute about three members and five members, and that was in regards to the permanent board, but not in regard to the interim governing body. So, yeah. Right, but I believe Pat's comment was to the permanent select board, not the transitional board. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Um, Irene, Hi. go ahead. Thank you. Um, just a couple of comments before I make my question, if I may. Uh, the select board, when I was on it, maybe 10 years ago, turned down request for an alternate. It was a memorable meeting because we held it over at the, Will the Williston Town Hall. So if anyone needs to search on the minutes to find it, um, that's where the decision was made. Uh, the chair of the Planning Commission at the time, who still is the chair of the Town Planning Commission, begged for an alternate and was turned down by the select board for what that's worth. So it's not a long-term tradition here to have one. Hmm. Um, although I fully understand why Tom wanted one last year and I'm glad that he got one. Um, as to Betsy's comments, on September 9th of 2019 at the select board meeting, Sarah Macy produced a number of charts mm -hmm. and indicated that the uh, average increase to the average home would be $329 for town outside the village using FY20 numbers. And then on December 12th of 2019, she produced a PowerPoint also using those zero numbers as her assumption. And while I understand that it's much easier to keep everything constant, I think it provides a false picture of what will happen here. Uh, the grand list usually goes up about 1% in the town outside the village. Um, expenses definitely go up 3% every year, often more. And I think to be fair, the people voting on a tax increase for themselves, they should know a more accurate estimate of what those expenses will be. So to follow on what Betsy asked for, I will emphatically ask that Sarah Macy redo her calculations with more precise numbers as to what might realistically be the increases for folks outside the village, as well as the decreases for folks inside the village. Um, I think I have two questions, one of which is uh, something I've said before, the sidewalks don't roll up and disappear in year number 13. Why are all of the special taxing districts expiring after 12 years? I would ask that you please rethink and redo section 104 parts C, D, and E. Obviously parts A, the debt assessment district, and B, the tax reconciliation district, can and should sunset after 12 years, but I would respectfully request that the other three districts remain in force for as long as that charter is in force. Okay. And finally, um, I'd ask that you would remove section 106D, which says that within three years after the first election of the six member new board, the select board shall appoint a commission to study the composition of voting boards. Uh, I don't believe there's any reason for a special commission on whose appointment there are no constraints, so they could all be friends of the chair, could be set up three years after a merged select board gets voted into office. The voters selected that three plus three model, and I think the voters should decide whether or not it works for them. Not a hand pick of, picked group of people, just three years in when that board is just starting to find its groove. I think that that section needs to come out as a good faith effort to say that that board structure is going to be given a fair chance to succeed and work rather than just knowing that three years later, it's gonna disappear. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments or questions about the charter? And if not, we will move on, but we will do this again on November 16th. And I'd like to thank everybody, the comments and questions. Oh, 
Uh, Tracy, hang on just a quick second, just making sure there isn't anybody else that hasn't already spoken. Um, looks like not. So go ahead, Tracy. Yeah, I just, I, I haven't looked at that section before, 106D. Um, I'm just wondering whether that should be delegated to the Board of Civil Authority uh, since it deals to the composition of voting wards. Um, it seems like that would be within their realm of responsibility. Mm. Okay. Uh, okay, thanks, Tracy. Uh, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on that section. This this was put in there by the uh, governance subcommittee. Somebody's got some really wind noise going on there. Their phone. Oh, there it goes. There we go. Okay, so this section was put in when when the the original proposal was to go with a two two plus two plus three model uh, because it was a, it was seen as a compromise between at large and ward representation, and and so that's that's why this section is in here. It was to to force a review of that model. Um, within a few years to, to make sure because it was a total, you know, the, the, the governance subcommittee viewed it as a totally experimental thing that may not work. Um, and then when things changed to the three plus three, uh, this section didn't come out. So that's, that's why it's in there. And then actually I read this as a view of the governance uh, model not just the because uh, we have another section that says that you look at the the specific wards uh every 10 years based on census and so this is really is an, an evaluation of the uh, the governance model and not just looking at the wards and that's what it was intent it's, it's, its intent was and then um for better or worse it stayed in when things changed Thanks for that, Andy. OK, so I'm not seeing any other raised hands and I'd like to thank everybody. These questions were excellent and really um, called attention to some parts of the charter that we haven't talked about with the public before. So thank you for your close reading and please come back next time with questions. Um, and in the meantime, please, please feel free to reach out to board members with questions or comments. You can email us, you can Zoom with us, you can text us, whatever you want to do. And um, we will do this again on November 16th. So thank you everyone for those um, really thoughtful questions. Um, okay, next item up is 5B presentation of the CCRPC annual report. And we have our guests Charlie Baker and Jeff Carr, the board's uh, representative to the CCRPC. Come on down. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, just, I'm assuming you got our report in your packet. Actually, I am 100% confident you did because I know Andy got a chance to review it in advance. Uh, <laughs> Greg, that was gonna be my question, Greg. Are you, were you gonna pull it up there? Thank you. Go, just um, let me know and I can, I'm happy to flip through for you. Yeah, so um, uh, as I uh, try to do every year, uh, we try to do a, just a customer service check-in with the select board, uh, ask for feedback about how we're doing in terms of uh, per, our, the services we're providing to the board. Um, for those of you not familiar with the Regional Planning Commission, uh, we are a state-enabled uh, body uh, created by the, the legislature to provide services to the municipalities in Chittenden County. Um, and uh, so this is our annual report. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. Uh, you can thank me later, uh, but I will skim it uh, quickly and touch on a few points. Um, the first page uh, gives you some of that background uh, about uh, with the RPC. We have a 29 member board. You get a little sense of that. Uh, and then our financials, we get dues from the town. Um, and we have about 11 to one return on investment. So for your dues, we bring in a lot more state and federal funds into the region. Um, and then, uh, and apologies, Elaine, uh, we are a, a year out of date here with regard to the alternate. I apologize for that. Um, but, uh, but thank you for sending Jeff our way as your uh, primary representative this last uh, number of years. 
We won't count them, Jeff, unless you want to. Um, <laughs> and also, um, thank you to your staff that participates in our committees, uh, Dennis and Darren and Annie. Uh, they are uh, very knowledgeable and, and valued uh, participants in those various committees. Um, and going on to the next page, we get into uh, specific things that we worked with the town on last year. I'm not going to uh, cover each one of those in details, uh, but a lot of water quality work uh, has been going on in the town in the last few years. Uh, we also did uh, quite a bit of energy work. Um, thank you for I really, I think, pulling us along to do a really successful button up event uh, last fall, last November. Uh, it was a huge event and Efficiency Vermont thought it was great. And uh, it was, uh, well, just thank you for that. <laughs> so uh, teamwork at, at, at work. Um, and then emergency management, GIS, traffic counts, uh, kind of typical stuff we help with uh, every year. Um, and then a little bit of technical assistance um, that we provided also. Um, any feedback for me on, on those specific projects that we worked on with you last year that you want to offer? Or And Jeff, I don't know if you want to add anything at this point. You're doing fine, Charlie. <laughs> okay. Yeah, any feedback for me on those? I think, Charlie, that um, the breadth the sheer breadth of projects that you are working on for us is kind of hard to wrap our heads around. Um, there is so much here that we couldn't possibly do on our own. And I think that's really a testament to you and your staff and the wise way you're using state funds and managing to bring them down to Essex and to Chittenden County. No, th thank you. And, and, uh, and it really is, um, I think part of it's a philosophy of you know us really being a supplement to the municipal staff. You know we're uh, not uh, dictating things uh, to you all, but really trying to help uh, the town, you know, all of our towns, really achieve uh, what they would like to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know much more of a support role that we're trying to play. Um, the next page, and uh, thanks, Craig. Um, you start to see uh, projects that are in our transportation improvement program. Uh, projects need to be in our tip. Uh, to allow for the flow of federal funds through VTRANS to these various projects. Uh, so we tried to list out um, what's not just in our TIP, but also in VTRANS's capital, uh, trans or, sorry, transportation capital program. Um, and so you can see these. Um, I will not claim to be an expert in all these projects, um, but uh, your list is about the longest list that I've seen. Uh, so um, that's I don't know if that's good or bad, if you have a lot of things that have been promised that are still coming or, but I think it really is a credit uh, to the town and your staff that have been working hard with uh, some of these uh, with VTRANS to get projects delivered, but a lot of them you've been working on um, on your own, uh, maybe with us at the beginning, but then taking them on. So uh, mm -hmm. credit, credit to the town. Um, and I don't know if there were any questions on any of those that I could follow up on. Mm -hmm. Select board members will recognize on the project list for the uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization, which everybody I think understands that there are really two organizations that are merged into one. And the Metropolitan Planning Organization is the one that focuses on the transportation project. So you'll notice that a lot of our projects that go through the RPC right now are what we call, they have CERC Alt next to them. And that was when um, the Circumferential Highway, the segments that weren't built, uh, AB, and then the parts out to Colchester, uh, beyond what we have in the town now, these are some of the projects that came about as a result of the mitigation uh, issues that were brought about by the termination of the Circumferential Highway. Right. So these are longstanding projects that have been on the, on the list for a long time and are gonna take a while to continue to complete. Well, we just finished the CERC alternatives process about two or three years ago. So they've been out there for about two to three years and there's three classes of them. We're going through phase one now and we're starting on phase two and then there'll be phase three, which actually phase three will benefit one of our neighboring municipalities, Williston, which will help make our CERC alternative projects even more effective than they would be 
before we dealt with the uh, Williston issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you look at that list, you'll see, yeah, as Jeff just mentioned, a lot of, you know, a reference to the circle alternatives. So those projects are, yeah, you know, they may have taken some time to go through the planning and design and permitting stage, but they're, you can, they're really queuing up. You have a lot of, you know, 20, 21, 22 uh, years in there. Um, and, and you have some phase three projects actually that are you know now scheduled for construction. So things have been moving along, and you know credit to the whole partnership between the the town and us and VTrans for um, getting these things moving along. So uh, if no questions or comments there. Um, I'll move on to the last section, which is uh, uh, a fairly long list of regional activities that we uh, you know taken on over the last year and most of them are continuing into this year uh, and probably for a number of years going forward. Uh, I'm not going to review all these. There's a, a wide range of topics here. Uh, two of them I want to just touch on um, just to scroll down a little bit further, Greg, the uh, the Building Homes Together campaign. Um, we're uh, just kind of reported out on our fourth year of the Building Homes Together campaign. Um, we have we wanted to build 3,500 new homes in Chittenden County in five years, so 700 a year. We're at about 32 or 3,300 homes now, um, and so we're like about 90% of the way in terms of the housing production, uh, you know, in in four years. So that's that's ahead of pace. Um, on the downside, is you know, we I think we were somewhat hopeful if we built that many homes that quickly that we would have a positive impact on the housing market. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, a news flash, we don't have the healthiest housing market in the world. Um, so our vac one of the ways we measure that is vacancy rate. And really the vacancy rate has not gone up that, that significantly. A healthy one is between uh, maybe three or closer to 5%. Uh, we, for a long time, have been under two. We're, it looks like we're just inching above uh, 2% now. Um, so we're not there yet. Um, that's a long way to say, uh, don't stop <laughs> uh, building and permitting new housing units. We still need more housing units. Uh, and the the second uh, thing th to call attention to is that we also had a target of getting to 20% of those being permanently affordable. Uh, we got to 13%. Actually, uh, 2019 was actually a very strong year for affordable housing production because of that affordable housing bond that the legislature and governor passed. Um, I think that was after his first year, so that was four years, but it you know, takes a couple years for it to actually hit the ground. Um, so we did pretty well last year, but going forward, we're not even getting to get, you know, we won't even, we'll be going down from 13%, I expect going forward. Um, so just to kind of highlight both, there needs to be more housing units and we need to do more work on making them affordable. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to follow up on that before I jump to the next topic. Charlie, can I ask you a quick question about the um, the CARES Act funding that was recently authorized for um, landlords to repair dilapidated housing and bring it back online? Are you familiar with how much of that's happening in Chittenden County and whether I that's going to impact our affordable housing? I have not heard anything specific on that. Okay. Um, yeah, and then I, you know, the other, the flip side is there was also CARES Act money, uh, you know, for people to make rent payments and things like yeah. that. Um, so I think, and and there was also a forestalling of any, um, you know, eviction notices and things. Yeah. Uh, so mostly from the housing community, so the the folks that work on affordable housing, I'm hearing concerns that there could be an increase in evictions and um, concerns like that. Um, so I, I don't know, I don't know what to expect in the COVID world uh, with all these moving dynamics. Mm. Andy, you have a question? Yeah, um, Charlie, thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. um, always enjoy hearing you talk. Um, on the, 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 the homes thing, uh, we hear a lot about single occupancy vehicles driving around, but we don't hear much about single occupancy housing. I read recently, I think that the the single occupancy housing rate is like 18% and that, that the part of the problem we have is empty bedrooms. Mm. Is there is there effort um, 
that you're involved with or aware of to fill those empty bedrooms, you know, unique, you know, other, you know housing alternatives or, or whatever? Yeah, um, we're not specifically involved, but there is a, a program uh, called Home Share Vermont, right, right. which I think, you know, specifically works to try uh, to help people, you know, particularly, you know, uh, let's say you were retired and, and single and, you know, uh, having a challenge maintaining your home or, or affording it. Um, that you know maybe the thing to do is to rent a room or you know a part of your house uh, to keep that affordable. So that that program exists. We're not directly involved with that. Um, you know, and I think that's no surprise that issue, right? We know household size has been decreasing, mm -hmm. family size has been decreasing. Uh, people are also living longer, and so we're we're getting to more single person households. Um, and I'm sure we have a lot more two-person households than we used to, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and that is part of what's fueling the need for more housing units. Um, the, the, and we are also growing um, at a, a pretty moderate percentage. Jeff probably has these numbers off the top of his head better than I do. But, um, you know, we're, we're less than half a percent population growth. Um, and, you know, so we still need some places, although I think I saw a number – for the last year that was saying we had flat population growth, um, even though we built, you know, 700 or 758 new homes. So, uh, which is an interesting dynamic, Andy, because it tells us like we also had a lot more people move out at the same time we had people come in, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. if you believe those numbers. And Jeff probably wants to comment. Yeah, Charlie, I think one of the things that the effort has done is it's drawn attention, Andy, to the forgotten middle because a lot of times the reason that we have empty bedrooms is because there's not an opportunity for empty nests or single person households to downsize because our inventory is contracted by about 65% over the last two and a half years. Um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little nervous about the population numbers, Charlie, because we're about as far away from the last actual data point as we can get over 10 and a half years now. And so when the 2020 census data comes out, hopefully it'll be more accurate and we'll get it here in the next four or five months. Maybe we can take a look and see how our actual population uh, fared in the state. And then obviously we can also see how it fared among the counties. But Andy, one of the th secrets to this is not just building affordable housing, but it's also having affordably or mid-range priced housing that people can downsize to, which then will free up four bedroom houses, which only have one or two people in it. My house is a perfect example. We're an empty nest household. We tried to downsize 18 months ago, but I, I get the thrill of paying about $50,000 more for my house, and I can't get a house that's less than 1,000 square feet larger than the one I live in. Right. And that's, and that's the real issue um, in, terms of, in terms of housing. And so, you know, we will. It, it's a multifaceted approach, and what a lot of people don't understand is if you've got a problem with empty bedrooms or with affordable housing, sometimes it's giving people the opportunity to move up who are in affordably priced housing that can also afford more housing um, on their incomes, but they don't have anywhere to go. I mean, I could sell my house. The good news is I could sell my house and get a premium price. The bad news is I'd have to live in a tent somewhere in somebody's front yard. <laughs> right. So on a personal note, that is a decision I made this summer to sell our big four bedroom house because my wife and I had more space than we needed. And I'm now renting and I'm looking for Jeff's tent to buy somewhere. <laughs> uh, so if, you know, if you're aware of a nice one in Essex, please let me know. Um, I, sorry, that was, that was a, an aside and not part of my uh, official report. But um, <laughs> the, the next topic um, is, uh, and sorry, Greg, I don't know if you want to still display it, but uh, racial justice, uh, the racial equity uh, conversation is right above that. And I don't have a lot to really report on this topic at this time, other than to say it is something uh, that uh, you know, I think we are interested in. Um, I am personally interested in making some progress on this. Um, it was an issue that really kind of really smacked me in the face when we did the first ECOS plan in, in 2011, 2012, uh, just to see the disparities we had in our community uh, it was pretty disheartening, um, well, is pretty disheartening. Um, and so uh, I'm, I think I'm hopeful we can make some progress on these issues, both as an organization internally, but also maybe start to address some of the policy issues that um, 
kind of support the systemic racism. Um, and so if there's, I think I want to bring this up really to ask uh, you and, and your community members, if there's anything that you can, you think that we could do as a regional planning commission that would help support any conversations or efforts that you're looking at in the town, please let us know. I think we're, we're much more in the listening mode at the moment, uh, but I'm hoping uh, 21 is uh, a period of more action on our part. Um, we did just put out an RFQ on Friday uh, to get a consultant partner to help us because uh, we're, we're not experts in this work. Um, and so we're uh, looking to bring in some expertise in this area. Um, but any, any initial thoughts about what would be helpful uh, to the town in this area? <clears throat> well, Charlie, this is Evan. Um, I don't know if you guys have studied density, you know, zoning density mm -hmm. as, as a predictor, of, you know, every, I'm sorry, let me go back. Density send, tends to be a function of land price sometimes. You know, how much does the person want for the land that determines what you can try to get, how many houses, et cetera, versus actually intentionally wanting to allow, say, these two-bedroom homes versus three- and four-bedroom homes to create that middle market again. Um, sometimes these four-bedroom homes really maybe started as two- or three-bedroom homes, and with the addition... They are now four bedroom homes, but the actual um, review of density and the type of home structure the market really needs and explaining that to the host community um, that it's not a bad thing to actually build a 1,200 square foot home versus mm -hmm. 3,000. Yeah. To yeah, get, and I think to get the results you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. and and there's no doubt um, that you know homes, and and I think even I think um, uh, well the number that's stuck in my head is from Burlington, but you know nationally, and I, I, Essex is probably pretty similar. Home ownership rate is you know 65, 70 percent. Mm -hmm. um, for the black residents of Burlington, it's four percent. Yeah, um, and so yeah that that really struck me and even uh household income uh you know, if that was a little bit of a surrogate for wealth um you know is is half uh the if you're the, i think you just the average household in uh, chitney county compared to a black household the black household is half the household income so i think there are some conversations going on about you know how do we measure the outcomes of uh you know racial inequity and then we'll get to the strategies, but definitely, you know, zoning and density and and uh, encouraging, you know, home ownership amongst those populations is going to be a, a significant part of it. Um, you know, how do how do families gain wealth? A lot of it's through their home, right? You, you buy a home in your 30s, and you you know you have it when you're ready to retire. Uh, makes a big difference in your life. If you rent your whole life, it's uh, hard to retire, right? Um, so. Anyway, uh, but so Evan, you know, I think this question about uh, housing density and, and it does play into the equity conversation for sure, um, and it's a, it's one of the areas I think we probably uh, maybe could be helpful digging into deeper, um, and and bringing that information back to towns of what would be helpful. Right. Which which also brings me to the point, you know, if maybe you can help, since we rely on you and CCRPC for being the voice of the regional approach. Um, you know, you 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 help all of our communities throughout Jindin County with a regional approach. And of course, housing is not just local to right. our municipality. It feeds off of the products that all of us have and the needs. So maybe you could touch a little bit on how it interplays and your role um, in that. In terms of the housing conversations, or the re just a broad regional approach, yeah, whether well, it's just racial talk equity or housing or um, services, yeah, um, yeah, and 
I'll, I'll stay on the housing point because I think this is an area, you know, where we, yes, we did the Building Homes Together campaign along with Champlain Housing Trust and Housing Vermont. But, uh, you know, we were also uh, hosting some housing convenings, as I think is what we ended up calling them. Uh, not the best label, but that's what, the, <laughs> that's what we ended up calling them. Um, but really just for the folks, uh, you know, your planners and uh, some of the managers, administrators, some housing, a lot of the towns have housing committees. Uh, to get those folks most interested to share in the county and bring best practices to them. And, you know, I think over the last few years that has helped uh, to some extent, and there's still more work to do there. I think the racial equity conversation is going to be somewhat similar. Um, you know, can we, you know, host conversations, learn together, uh, work on best practices together? Um, yeah, and, and hopefully we can support, uh, yeah, it, it is a multi- <laughs> It's more than one town for sure, Evan. I mean, for us, I'll just give one last. It for us, it's nice, and to, we don't always keep abreast of what someone else is doing. You know, we may never know. I mean, we may know what Williston is doing because they're in our backyard, but Shelburne, albeit you know maybe ten miles away, sometimes feels a lot farther or or someone else you're just not aware and you help bring those ideas back to the groups yeah thanks yeah, we do we do try thank you uh so, charlie yeah i was wondering if specifically around racial equity um have you had any success or maybe you could share some success around specifically the title uh, public engagement. Um, I think, you know, we've had a facilitator come in um, with Tabitha Moore. Um, you know, we've had conversations in our community. Um, but I think that we found certainly before that, and I suspect what we'll find after that engagement is done, is that having, uh, finding, uh, you know, the BIPOC, uh, you know, people of color to, you know, get involved in municipal government and, you know, attending meetings, um, you know, that sort of thing is, is something that we struggle with. Um, mm -hmm. Have you had any success or do you have a, maybe more of a network that taps into, you know, something, you know, locally, whether it be with, you know, new American populations, anything like that, or are you running across the same sort of issues we are where it's just kind of difficult to sometimes make those inroads? Yeah, no, I think definitely the issue's there, um, yeah, but it doesn't mean we stop trying. Uh, so I think the couple uh, places and projects where we've had some more success for with that um, have been uh, in Winooski in the old north end of Burlington, um, you know, where there's communities more concentrated and maybe there's actually um, a little bit of infrastructure around those uh, groups or organizations. Um, in Winooski, actually, when we were working on uh, some planning with them, we actually uh, contracted with uh, some residents, um, and they kind of created a little network of high school students uh, to really get into a lot of different uh, cultural groups that we don't have contacts with directly. Um, and, you know, and that was effective uh, in that uh, episode. You know, we, we got some feedback at that time as part of that effort um, and use it also. Uh, we use it a couple different ways in Winooski, um, but it's it's not um, I don't think we've actually established those relationships that and they're not ongoing. Right. Um, yeah. uh, so the engagement. So I'm going to say uh, we took a step, but it, we need to do more <laughs> So <laughs> work in progress. OK, great. Well, hey, Patrick, this is Jeff. I think we can always do more, but I think Charlie is selling short uh, the extraordinary efforts that the RPC has made uh, through its public outreach for things like the ECOS plan. We were doing the ECOS plan and, and we have, a, I think, a, 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 I mean, it needs updating, um, but we have a pretty innovative uh, uh, public involvement plan uh, mm -hmm. that we operate under as a, a RPC. And I'm a firm believer in municipal government and in public uh, sector to steal every good idea that's out there and not reinvent the wheel. 
Yeah. So I'm thinking, Charlie, that it might be good to have Patrick and anybody else on the board who wants to see so, to see to see our public involvement plan that's being updated now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And also to look at the outreach that we did on ECOS, which included things like providing daycare services for people who had kids in, in uh, minority populations so they could come and participate in our public involvement and uh, feedback that we got on the ECOS plan and those types of things. I mean, at the time, we were all a little bit taken aback uh, by, you know, like paying people to come and, and, and tell us what they thought about our plans and things like that. But in the end, I think it was a really good approach and we got feedback on the ECOS plan that we wouldn't have gotten had we not done that. And so since I wasn't involved in designing it, I was only involved in reviewing it as a board member. Uh, I'm gonna sing the praises of the RPC because at the time we were doing it, it was a very innovative and untried approach and we stuck our necks out a little bit and actually it worked out pretty well. So it pays to sometimes be creative and to do things that uh, ordinarily would have rubbed people the wrong way. I mean, the first time somebody told me we were gonna pay people to show up and, and participate in a forum to react to our ECOS plan, my reaction was, huh? Right. And, but that was really a, one way that we were able to, even though it still isn't optimum and we can do more, we made inroads at reaching populations that had never reacted to our work at least in the first 19 years, 18 years that I was on the RPC MPO board. Yeah, and th thanks Jeff for reminding me of the <laughs> things we've done. Um, and you know what was key about that though, Patrick, to get back to your point is um, that we found a, a partner who had a lot of those relationships. And so I, I kind of grabbed a hold of her and held her very tightly <laughs> in a, very appropriate way, professionally. And uh, <laughs> sorry, I realized I was digging a hole there. Um, but um, but she was really instrumental in making those connections and you know helping get people to meetings. And really, they uh, she had relationships that people trusted. And so we got a lot of input that we would I would never have gotten on my own. Um, unfortunately, she moved out of town. So. Um, hence, we're you know now looking for another partner at this at this point in time, uh, as we look at updating the ECOS plan. But thanks, Jeff. That that was a good yeah, point. It's and the reason is we're all of uh, a persuasion uh, that is in the majority, and we don't know what it's like to be in the minority in many respects in many things that we do. So if yep. you don't go out and actively solicit and reach out and reach out in innovative ways you will never get that perspective. Yep. And so, uh, and to follow up on Jeff's point, we did do our public participation plan. Um, Burlington, when they did theirs, uh, borrowed liberally from ours. Uh, so there's there may be, you know, an iteration uh, improved upon ours. Um, and I think even VTrans uh, also borrowed ours and did an iteration of improvement. So those might be two areas to look at if you wanted to look at a public engagement plans, uh, both those organizations have moved maybe a little bit beyond us, I hope. Um, and I'm hoping, as Jeff said, as we update in the next year or two, um, we'll we'll get we'll get back in front again on this conversation. Yeah, um, well, when you finish it, definitely exactly. pass it along because I would love to see it. And I'll absolutely take a look at Burlington and I'm sorry, was it GMTs you said? VTrans. VTrans, sorry. Yep. So um, so anyway, sorry, that, that was really the end of my report. I know uh, Andy may have some questions about um, energy issues. And I did want to address one thing, Andy. Uh, I saw you mentioned that some of the links aren't working. There's something, and this happened last year too, about when I send a PDF <laughs> to the town and, and the town posts it into your packet that breaks some of the links. I apologize for that. I'm, I'm not sure how to fix that. Um, but if, uh, and, and Greg, I think I shared uh, a couple direct links to your town and village reports on our website where the links all do work. Um, so if if it's, uh, Greg, I don't know if you can share those later, but um, that would be appreciated because I'm I'm sorry you had that issue, Andy. It's hard to look at a resource when the link doesn't work. Well, I'll, I'll know better next time to look for it directly on your website rather than trying to follow the link. Because so. <laughs> yeah, I remember it did happen last year as well. Yeah. 
So can I go with my, my question? Absolutely, please. Yeah, so um, um, I, I drive a, a plug-in hybrid because, uh, you know, a, a car that goes 200 miles on battery is just too expensive. Um, and if you if you run out of juice, you're calling a flatbed. You know, there's you, you can't you just come with a gas can and, and fill it up. And so the the question I guess I have is whether there's I, I know I I, I saw, did did find your report about putting uh, uh, car chargers in multi uh, unit developments. Um, if I'm getting the the term right, um, but I'm I'm wondering if there's any any path to um, incenting employers to put in charging stations so that if you have a you know, a, a 30 mile commute, you can you feel comfortable driving your electric car to work and, and, and plugging it in and then being able to drive home. Um, the other the other in thing that might be interesting is having a, an ability to reserve a slot for charging. If you know you're going to go someplace and there's a charging charger available, I don't know if those are things that that you know, you're involved with at all. Yeah, yeah, we're uh, we're not in charge of those things, but uh, we do try to help uh, make those uh, good yeah. things happen. Um, and uh, and for those of, of you maybe uh, watching from home, uh, I think Andy's referring to some of our energy work. There's a lot of other different topics um, that are listed in the end of this report, um, energy being one of them. Um, and the report that you saw about multi-unit properties was just what we did last fiscal year. If you go back to previous fiscal years, uh, you'll find uh, recommendations or reports that we worked with VEIC on um, to uh, support yeah, at employers, charging at employers. Um, also, what towns can do you know, as they're reviewing new development. Um, so a number of towns have included that in their development requirements, uh, you know, maybe with some criteria set out. Um, and then also, you know, just even looking, uh, working with the state on mapping out, you know, where are charging public charging stations, where where are there gaps, where do they need to be more? So, I think we've over the last number of years um, tried to do quite a bit to support that charging infrastructure. Um, they, there's still a lot more to do as the, you know, that industry transitions. I mean, and you can hear the car companies. I mean, they're they're mm -hmm. working actively on transitioning. Um, and so I, I'm sure, I'm confident that the infrastructure that that's going to require is going to uh, transition right along with it. Um, but it, it's, it's coming, you know, I think it's probably the yeah. thing. No, no news to you, Andy. Yeah, yeah, okay. My other question was about, I think there's some a reference in here about a, a regional emergency management plan. And my... Uh, yeah, um, we we work with all the towns on their uh, the their local emergency management plans. Okay, so there's no regional. And and we do a regional um, all hazard mitigation plan. Okay, okay, that's a different is, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which you know is, is the document, and I can't remember if your question it might get to pandemics or anything else, but. Um, yeah, well, the, the the question is right. It is is whether uh, with the potential of a second wave coming, whether whether um, municipalities should be reviewing their plans, or if there was a regional plan, whether there should be a a review of those to see what's what is and isn't working, and then also the fact that we're going into uh, colder weather and snow and potentially um, staffing issues around snow plows. Yeah. Um, is there any anything coordinated there to to deal with, you know, snow removal if uh, if a, a a town gets hit pretty hard with COVID and they lose their staff? Yeah, I, we um, not in a deep way, Andy, or maybe I shouldn't say maybe I should say not in a very specific way. You know, I think the the thing about uh, you know emergency response that all the towns have done a very good job working on are those mutual aid agreements, right? And, you know, if there's a big fire in one community, you know, and the fire company is closer from the next door, like like they come and help, right? Like there's no questions asked. Um, I, I fully expect that same circumstance would, would play out, um, you know, if somebody had a crisis 
and you know didn't have staff to support it that uh, neighboring towns would help um, just as you would help a neighboring town you know when they needed help um, but it, it the the interesting thing about these um, you know the emergency management plans or, or the incident command system is it it doesn't like drill all the way down to every detail it sets up more of a process and a system so that that can flex and respond to whatever situation presents itself um, and so you know those things work uh, we definitely need to do more work you know we never have talked about pandemics as mm -hmm. a big threat in Chittenden County before um, you know we talked about some things related to uh, you know uh, uh, climate change you know and and heat and weather events and things like that um, but this is definitely something that um, over the next next year we'll be updating the hazard mitigation plan for Chittenden County. So um, I'll I'll just say heads up on that. You know, sometime, well, probably uh, maybe 12 months, 14, 15 months from now, um, there will be a plan in front of in front of you guys for action uh, to approve your part of that plan. Uh, every town has an annex about uh, what they're gonna do. And so we'll have an opportunity to address the pandemic in more detail. Okay. And then my, my last question is you got a section about transportation demand management, mm -hmm. um, which doesn't mention telecommuting. And I don't know if that's a mitigating factor that you consider um, you know, oh. broad, broadband access, those kind of things, you know. Yeah, always. Um, and again, I wanna reiterate like this is, you know, specific things that we did last, fiscal year, mm. um, yeah, the uh, telecommuting is definitely, right, uh, something that everybody's <laughs> that doing now, doing yeah. Mid-March, yeah. a lot more. Um, and it's been interesting because, you know, most of our efforts had been focused on alternative transportation. Um, and it's been, right, it was a very fast transition for most of us to be working from home. Um, and uh, but we have not had any specific things that I can think of. Maybe Jeff can think of things going further back, um, really focused on telecommuting. Uh, you know, we have been you know, trying to help with broadband issues and things like that, but it's clearly a major part of what's going to be in our future. Um, it's and you know, transportation patterns are changing as a result of it. Um, so I think we'll be supporting that. I mean, it's 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 good for. <clears throat> You know, energy use is good for transportation congestion. You know, there's lots of benefits that are coming with it, um, even though we may also as a society be kind of tired of it <laughs> and and schooling kids at home. You know, there are some some things I think we'll be wrestling with to uh, try to keep the good parts and and maybe um, go go back to some ways about, um, you know, that are more normal in terms of how we interact as society. But I'll, I'll leave that at that. <laughs> There's more to do there. Andy, I've been asking the same question on things like the uh, I-89 for 50-year corridor study that we're doing mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. And so and I know that's something that's in the frontal lobe of the staff because um, they are, you know, concerned about that from the standpoint of, you know, making these substantial investments in the future uh, without knowing whether or not the demand line is going to change in trajectory. And that and the complicated thing right now is, is that um, this is still unfolding uh, in terms of where telecommuting might actually end up in terms of a structural change or a long-term change in the scheme of things. I mean, um, the concern and the threat to telecommuting, telecommuting still is that we get an effective therapy or an effective uh, vaccine, which will encourage to this COVID-19 virus, which will encourage people to, to a larger extent, revert back to the old traditional office setups. Um, I think there's been some kind of a shift though. And I think that the staff at the RPC agrees in that at least the stigma of telecommuting in terms of advancing your career seems to have changed yeah. uh, for the positive. But the degree in which telecommuting could um, could grow in Vermont is going to be a function of how the pandemic changes things in the long term, whether or not we've got the infrastructure that we need that allows more people to telecommute outside of certain parts of the state which have the high speed and the, and the ability to connect. 
Um, and so obviously that's something for Chittenden County, but you know, there's some pretty rural areas in, in, our, in our county um, in the scheme of things. So I know that the staff is struggling with how to make sure that it's fully considered without making too much of a leap that it's gonna get wider acceptance and broader use than it could end up within the planning horizons that we have for some of these studies. And so if we would, if Operation Warp Speed does give us a therapy and or an effective vaccine, that'll sugar off faster than if we're in a situation where like with the HIV virus, we still don't have a vaccine yet. Mm -hmm. It's 30 years in the making. And the, the degree in which this virus mutates mm -hmm. from back in my microbiology scientific days is the thing that's gonna determine how effective we are short of um, some of the other public policy alternatives, which aren't the best result in terms of the degree of expense associated with the, uh, with the illnesses associated with the virus and some of the long-term issues, including unnecessary deaths. So that's really still developing in the scheme of things. And it's something that I've talked to Elaine Churchill at length over and also if you look at some of the tapes, we've had this discussion before we went virtual in actual RPC meetings. Yeah. Okay. And, I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll think I'll end on the note that um, in the coming weeks, you'll, uh, well, probably mostly the staff will get a request for uh, any projects that you'd like us to consider in our work program for FY22. Um, and so, yeah, if, if, uh, Essex thought we should like dig into the telecommuting phenomena more um, or how to make that work better or I, I don't know whatever about it that or or uh, zoning uh, assistance you know uh, please be aware and I, I think you know, you're probably pretty used to January time frame voting on what you're going to ask us to help with um, and you know we do try to help with whatever we can so just encourage you if you if you have some policy issues or maybe even it's public engagement um, if you have some issues that you'd like us to uh, work on to help support the town, that's uh, you have, you're going to have a chance to ask in the next couple months. Charlie, that's a very important point. And I don't know if you were listening earlier on in the meeting when one of our residents was asking about how will we address the different land development codes and zoning bylaws of the village and the town should we merge. And we will lean on you heavily for support as we do that. All right. I, uh, we'll look forward to that. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't, as long as you don't make it too hard on us, like don't give us an impossible task. You have uh, never let us down before. <laughs> no pressure. You okay? Perfect, perfect. Now, thank you. We really enjoy working with you all. So, thank you. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you, Jeff, for being an excellent representative and for letting me tag along as alternate. Oh, no. uh, you're a quick study, Elaine. Don't worry. About it. <laughs> thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay, it's always a pleasure to hear from Charlie. So the next item of business is a um, discussion of employment of a public employee, which will need to be done in executive session. So let's skip down to the consent agenda so that we can um, do the executive session at the end of the meeting. Would anyone like to move and, and second the consent agenda so that we can discuss it? Go ahead, Dawn. I move that we accept the consent agenda as presented. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Vince. And any discussion of the consent agenda? All right. Sounds like it's all on the up and up. We have a motion and a second on the table. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the consent agenda is approved. Item seven, reading file, board member comments and other information. Any board members? Okay, then, um, oh, Pat, I see your hand. Um, just wanted to uh, make a note, the uh, memo from Chief uh, Hogue in there about the uh, body cameras. Um, I know that these have been coming for a while. Um, 
it's been shared that they were waiting for the uh, the new cameras with the extended battery life. So we know that those have been on their way for a bit. But I really think that it uh, you know, goes to show how responsive our police department is about you know making sure that they're you know going to be uh, able to uh, you know display you know exactly what goes on in every traffic stop every you know reporting that goes on it's just a, a great thing to see and a excellent investment so uh, kudos to them thanks pat anyone else okay um then all we have left now is to go to our executive session so um andy would you like to put forth the motions to do that Sure, there's only one motion. I move that the select board enter into executive session to discuss the employment of a public employee in accordance with 1 VSA section 313A3 and to include the unified manager, deputy manager, police chief, and human resources director. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dawn. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So Greg has sent us all an invitation to a separate executive session. Greg, do you wish us to return to this link after? I don't believe so. Evan, Travis, or no. Chief, do we need to come back? I believe we are not uh, planning on coming back, so you can let everybody know we will not be coming back and we will adjourn from executive session what he said okay thank you everyone for a good meeting and we'll see you in the other link <laughs>